Hello, welcome back to The Living Process. My name is Greg Madison. My guest this time is Peter Afford. Uh, Peter is a very well-known uh, focusing-oriented therapist in the UK, although he has just closed his therapy practice. Uh, but he's also uh, very active in the focusing world and uh, has taught focusing and focusing-oriented therapy for very, very many years, including workshops on dreams and TAE, his most recent work has been, and for some years now, has been on neuroscience, including this book, Therapy in the Age of Neuroscience. And I'd really recommend the book. I found it fascinating. I found it subtle in his presentation and very clear. And I can see in many ways how his understanding of the biological bases of experiencing not only supports a lot of what we do as focusing-oriented therapists and focusers, but also gives us another way of thinking of, about parts of it. And uh, we touch on that quite a bit, and it leads into some discussion of the felt sense and the importance and centrality of that concept and even felt sensing in organizations and in groups. We also talk a little bit about the different hemispheres and how they may be active in felt sensing and a felt shift and how the left hemisphere is quite a dominant uh, influence in our world and uh, Peter's ideas and how maybe that needs to be more balanced. In full disclosure, uh, the neuroscientific way of seeing things, it isn't something that I tend to emphasize, and the language is not a language that's that familiar to me. But I found uh, talking to Peter really interesting, and it actually uh, made me a little bit more open to uh, this way of understanding things. So I hope you enjoy this episode on... Uh, Neuroscience and the Felt Sense with Peter Afford. So, welcome, Peter. Thank you. Very nice to have you on uh, The Living Process. And the thing that I normally ask people, first of all, and I'd like to ask you, is how you originally found out about focusing, got into this strange world of uh, Endland's work? Yes. Well, I, I love answering this question because I got into it via an even stranger world. Oh. In Sydney, Australia in 1984. Uh, my story is I was uh, training to work with an, org an organization called, uh, it's going to be called Transformations. It's about pop psychology and transforming your life. It actually got called Self Transformations because in Sydney, the name Transformations had already been registered by a painting and decorating company. <laughs> <laughs> It was self transformations, and uh, my wife at the times, my first wife Sophia and I, had got involved with them here, and we went to Sydney to for six months uh, mm -hmm. to train quite intensively, and we did a course called Being of Service, where they train people to work on their wacky weekend workshops. Uh, so fifty people in a room for two evenings uh, to learn focusing. And focusing was sandwiched between some gestalt learning, some gestalt techniques, and past life regression. <laughs> <laughs> and so focusing was a bit different, <laughs> and it was billed as um, uh, in this very enticing, mysterious way. Like if you learn focusing, you can sort all out uh, all your neuroses and hangups and everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, now, the only problem was that you can't teach focusing to 50 people 
over two evenings. And the woman who taught it, Helenia Cornelius, who was excellent, uh, had not been taught by anybody. <laughs> uh, she had read book and, and, and that, and she did her best. And I was not a natural focuser, so I couldn't get it. But I was very intrigued. Um, so it was sort of left dangling. And then Sophia and I came back to England and she was a bit of a natural focuser and she had to teach the same course here in England, in London. Uh, and um, so a pile of, I remember a big sack of Joan Glenn's little focusing book arrived, like 50 copies to give to everyone and a cassette tape of a talk Joan Glenn gave in the early 1980s to a hypnotherapy conference, hmm. uh, which talk I still have. And last year I digitized it and it's now on the TV website. And it's really interesting here, Gene talking uh, in his younger days, very, very alive, very engaging um, uh, talk. So, uh, okay, at that time I still had to learn focusing for myself but Sophia was teaching it, and I studied biodynamic psychotherapy for a year, the Gerda Boysen technique, and they had the same philosophy and attitude uh, as uh, we have in focusing about allowing the body to do what the body wants to do. Rather different because it's very massage-based work on massage table. Uh, but the, the the feel of it, the philosophy of it was uh, was essentially uh, the same. So after uh, two or three years, I got the hang of focusing for myself. Um, so that's a bit of a long-winded answer. Um, as soon as I got the hang of it, I was practicing it for myself, and then I started uh, teaching it to small groups in London. That is fascinating. I didn't know most of that history um and it makes me wonder what was it even though you couldn't quite get it why did you remain interested in it in some way uh, because it um it, it it held out the promise of the holy grail oh, okay <laughs> yeah like this is a way to um connect with your feeling life and i guess back then i had problems with my feeling life, my emotional life. Uh, I still didn't get it. I felt very inadequate uh, about it. Um, and in the self-transformations thing, I got very involved with for a couple of years. It's completely insane, but uh, great fun. I did learn something from it. Uh, the whole, it was this whole thing that you had at that time, early 1980s, of provoking people into emotional catharsis. You know, if you get out all your anger and you get out all your uh, your tears and your crying, then you're going to be liberated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and at the, the end of a weekend with them, you, we were all liberated. And we had fantastic parties. The only trouble was uh, give it a, a, a week later and you're sort of back to square one with certain feelings. And what do I do now? Oh, I better go and do another of their weekends. Well, obviously, this wasn't quite it. So it was focusing that uh, finally uh, helped me to find my feelings uh, mm -hmm. and allow my feelings to flow. And it's just so simple. Mm -hmm. But as we know, um, it, it, it's so easy not to be that simple about it. Absolutely, yeah. So you, once you kind of got the hang of focusing, you started to teach it did a therapy training, got involved in BFA? What, uh, well, let's go step at a time. <clears throat> uh, I have to bring Jung in here, I'm afraid, because I started oh. with Jung. Okay. Well, before that, before Jung, I started with meditation. Um, uh, meditation led to the self-transformations and uh, also time at Findhorn Foundation in Scotland, which a lot of people will have heard of. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was at Findhorn, I read Jung, and Jung really got me into psych world. I was completely hooked. Hmm. And then I found uh, self-transformations and um, focusing and gentling and biodynamic therapy. So I got into 
all of those. And I got used to teaching classes, it started with teaching meditation classes. So it was quite natural for me to want to teach focusing to, to small to small groups. I was into doing that. Uh, and uh, it, it was only a two or three years later that uh, I pinned myself down and said, I need to do a proper professional training as a therapist. So I went to uh, do the psychosynthesis training in London, uh, 19, starting 1990. And I was a complete pain in that group because I knew focusing. Yeah. And the, I had I had some very, um, in, very, very seminal experiences. Uh, the one that stands out for me was, um, I think this is relevant in this context, mm-hmm. um, we had as part of the three year training, we had some, we had two or three Gestalt intensives, which were five days each. Uh, we had, we were in a wonderful group, 20 people or so, and we had a brilliant Gestalt teacher, uh, uh, Mar- Malcolm Parlett, who's well known uh, in the Gestalt world uh, here. And I remember he did a, you know, his assistant did a demonstration session in the group with somebody. Um, and we were well into the course by then, probably halfway through this three-year training. And the session didn't really work. Uh, somebody volunteered and they had some sort of issue they wanted to explore. And they did all, they did all these gestalt things. It didn't quite work. And at the end, Malcolm said, uh, commented, uh, well, I think it's probably something to do with your mother, I think it might have been mother, it was something like that, parental, mm-hmm. and it just going back to basic uh, sort of Freudian ide- ideas. And I sat there and I was going bananas because what hadn't happened in this demonstration session was the volunteer being allowed to sit quietly with her felt experience, her felt sense, and allow a process to come from that. And I had worked enough with focusing by then to know bloody well that if she'd been allowed to do that, it would have almost certainly unfolded and it'd been a very uh, satisfactory uh, uh, process and a good dem- demonstration. And then the whole group hated me because it's like I'm sitting there being clever clogs. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I know better than this very experienced this drought trainer what to do. But that really stuck with me. And uh, the value of focusing relative to other uh, excellent techniques and approaches like psychosynthesis and gestalt and you know that works yeah i i can resonate with that experience of being in a therapy training knowing focusing and seeing where just a few moments of silent staying with something would be so helpful yeah so i know that you went on for many years teaching FOT and dream work mm-hmm. for a while, but because we don't have a lot of time, maybe we should skip to the neuroscience stuff that you've also been doing for quite a while now. Okay, before we do that, okay. I'll just put in the other important bit for me of the yeah. from the historical good perspective. You yeah. see, I've learned focusing. I've got the hang of focusing, mm-hmm. and. Late in 1990, I was very lucky. Somebody I taught focusing to, David Guinness, um, he was very enthusiastic about it. And he funded me to go to Chicago and do the week long. Hmm. So I went over there. And what I found was that I was doing focusing and teaching focusing the way that they were. Uh, This was Mary McGuire, Barla Jason, Reva Bernstein, and some other people, well known. Uh, uh, luminaries from the past and focusing Mm. but what I hadn't got was the listening side and uh, my uh, watching them observing them do experiential listening Mm. was a complete jaw dropper for me Uh, and when I came back to England I I felt again I'd found the holy grail Mm-hmm. And I noticed how that the the style and in a way technique of listening uh, was was not practiced by like my psychosynthesis trainers, and how valuable it it obviously was. So that was a 
another huge piece of the jigsaw puzzle uh, for me. Yeah, the listening side of it, you could see as a therapist, you could see where that was missing mm. in sessions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's be, it comes down to quite specific things. When somebody becomes a little emotional, there's something going on in there. Um, the psychosynthesis people would, um, uh, the therapist or the person demonstrating the therapist's role would just keep their mouth shut. So they would allow the silence okay. and leave the person in that space, but there would be silence and there would never be the sort of experiential response mm -hmm. which supports mm -hmm. the person's focusing process and that overcomes the tendency for the person to feel uh, shame. To yes. Go into shame state. Yeah. Because they're touching into a very vulnerable place, and the person who's supporting them is just silent. And in that silence, uh, it can uh, shame can come in. It can something feel... wrong. So exactly. By saying the very simple things, aha, yes, aha, mm -hmm, even really simple things like that, person feels supported, and it makes all the difference. Yeah, I totally agree. Those um, simple indications of acceptance mm. are it's so okay. different. Sorry? It's okay. Yes, it's exactly. Okay be feeling what I'm feeling. I'm okay. That's, exactly. what it, that's what it says. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And how silence, just silence without something like that can feel rejecting. Yeah. abandoning almost yeah yeah and we know that 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 uh infants need mm -hmm. something like like that mm -hmm. they don't need to just be left they need to be held and touched and maybe little, little sounds things that mother or attachment person says to them to help them learn uh what's slightly technical term, affect regulation. As you're saying that, I also think of my dog. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> when I'm out walking my dog and something happens and often he'll look at me. He's looking for some reassurance from me. Right. Yeah. And if I was just silent, yeah. he wouldn't know what to do next. But if yeah. I say, it's yeah. okay, it's okay. Right. Then he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, isn't it funny that we need to talk to our dogs and our cats? And we do. Yes. And it, it's what's implicit in our speech yeah. that the dog or the cat um, uh, picks up and, and responds to. Yeah, exactly. It's the energetic tone or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now that could lead into neuroscience. Okay. I'm, cur I'm, I'm curious, first of all, I'm very curious, especially because of everything you've said, because what you've been talking about, to me, it um, indicates kind of areas of psychotherapy that any therapist listening to this would probably recognize some of the things you've been talking about and some of the things that focusing adds. Mm -hmm. But also it felt when you're talking about Jung that there might be even a sort of a slightly transpersonal aspect to your interests. I don't know if that's true or not, Yeah. but I don't hear anything that I see the link to neuroscience. So I'm curious how that got ignited uh, for you. Okay. Well, the reason for that is quite simple, that neuroscience is a completely different body of knowledge from okay. psychological theory. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't fit in as another uh, theoretical model for psychotherapy. It's something completely different. Okay. And this is a point I have to keep making again uh, and and again. Mm -hmm. um, and so you keep your psychological theory and then you uh, get this body of, of knowledge that goes under the title of neuroscience, but it's really about our biology to learn our biology that underlies our psychology. And I'm curious why you went in that direction. 
<laughs> what well, was that's the a good question? Uh, the how did I go in that direction? It's something I can't explain this, but it's something about my kind of a mind. My kind of a mind has never found philosophy very appealing, and finds all the uh, well, most of the philosophy stuff and German's philosophy uh, unappealing. It, I, I just don't take to it. Whereas, I, although I'm not a scientist uh, uh, and I can never be a scientist, I do like, uh, I always have liked science, uh, bits of science I'm interested in. So, uh, 21 lunchtime, 25, probably more than 25 years ago, I went into Waterstones bookshop. And Damasio's book called The Feeling of What Happens mm -hmm. fell off the shelves into my hand. And it all started from there. And this title, The Feeling of What Happens, uh, I thought, hello, this is up my street. Mm -hmm. And it was. Mm -hmm. Because actually the way he um, describes what he calls the feeling of what happens uh, from a neuroscience perspective, but also from an experience perspective, clearly he was writing from his own experience. He had to be, mm. as well as his scientific research perspective. He was talking about the felt sense. Mm -hmm. So that got me started. And then I read more Damasio, like his previous book, Descartes' Era, which has some cr very, very important things in it. <laughs> Uh, and I uh, I went on from there. I was hooked. And now my bookshelves, <laughs> there's just tons of neuroscience books. You've already kind of touched on one of the maybe misapplications or misunderstandings of neuroscience in psychotherapy, that it isn't actually another kind of school of psychotherapy. No. It's something else. Oh, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I guess I'm wondering what are the what are the sorts of things that you have found useful about studying neuroscience as a focusing oriented therapist, and what are kind of maybe common misconceptions that you come across? Mm. Well, um, the a lot of neuroscience uh, has made sense to me because. It speaks to my experience, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my focusing experience, my experience in therapy, and it starts to make sense of a lot of the, particularly the very weird stuff that happens in the therapy room. Now, there's plenty of psychological theory uh, that goes into the same territory. Uh, I, for me, uh, the neuroscience take on it is often a better explanation. Hmm. There's a very good example of this, which is polyvagal theory, which everyone's heard about polyvagal theory these days, haven't they? Stephen Porsche. See, Stephen Porsche says that sometimes uh, biobehavioral explanation or account of what's happening is better, it's of more use, than a psychological explanation. And I agree with him. And this particularly applies to uh, trauma and trauma material. Mm -hmm. And us therapists, we, we psychologize everything. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's less of that in the focusing world. Um, uh, uh, you know, not like there would be in amongst the Jungians or the Freudians or the Kleinians and, and whatnot. But, I mean, I've been doing this for years and other people do it. It's, we tend to psychologize. Mm -hmm. And there's a, I think there's a place, particularly with trauma, where the psychologizing uh, doesn't work very well. And if you look into the biology, the neurobiology, which is body as well as brain, Mm -hmm. happening you get a better description and so one reason that polyvagal theory is caught on is it speaks to people's experience 
uh, just like Gentler. Mm -hmm. In his writing, he speaks to people's personal experience. So although there's a lot of conceptual stuff, it makes sense internally. Could you give an example of uh, what would be either would be a trauma or a different example where the uh, biological explanation makes more experiential sense? Yeah. Well, okay. If when somebody is in a uh, highly aroused uh, trauma, traumatic state, say in the middle of a therapy session, or they arrive to the session in that kind of state, mm -hmm. the first thing we need to do is attend to their um, hyper aroused, probably very distressed state, mm -hmm. bring them down, settle them down. Yeah. Because they're in a state where focusing the felt sense are nowhere to be found. Yeah. You know? They need human contact. And that's a process of helping them to uh, calm down and come into a place where they can be uh, inside, in their bodies, and they can connect with us, the, um, the, the therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you follow the sort of body-based uh ideas and protocols for for doing that yeah you'll do much better and as alan shaw says uh interpretations psychological interpretations in a trauma state are worse tend to be or probably are worse than useless they can really mess people around yeah i i guess one of the things that occurs my experience, I've been to a couple of very big conferences that are on neuroscience with some of the big names in the, the sort of neuro trauma sort of world like, in, in London, um, like Daniel. Dan Siegel. Yeah, Dan yeah. Siegel and um, Bessel van Veldekoek. Van Koch, yeah. yeah. And a few other people whose names I'm sure you would know, but I've forgotten. Um, and there was a couple of things I was struck by. One was they were actually very sophisticated. They didn't think of the brain as a separate organ. They think of the brain, the body, the environment as a whole system. Yeah. So I'm a little concerned about how sometimes that gets shortened by therapists to just the brain. Yeah. Um, but, but they weren't doing that. The other thing that I noticed is they were very, very humble in terms of their claims. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. And I thought when I read your book, I felt those things were present as well, that there's a sophistication. I mean, it needs to be read more than once because there's an awful lot in there. Mm -hmm. And there's also a nuanced perspective on this. You're not saying neuroscience should replace everything. Um, but you are saying there is a place for it, and you have different examples of how a neuroscientific point of view can slot in to therapy very usefully. Mm -hmm. Now, my perspective on the, the example you just gave, and this is a question that comes for me, even at those conferences, I left feeling affirmed. Right. I didn't leave feeling like I had really learned anything new. Uh -huh. And even what you're saying now, I'm thinking, well, as a focusing oriented therapist, of course, we know the importance of grounding, mm -hmm. of kind of being able to be with something rather than overwhelmed by it. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing I keep coming back to is as a focusing oriented or experiential therapist, in the way that we practice, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how much of kind of the wisdom of neuroscience, even though it's in a different language, is already in the practice. Mm. Well, and, it might be. <laughs> it, but it all depends. Yeah. Because when you say the practice, mm -hmm. everyone's practice is their own practice. And the weird thing about therapy 
is that we don't know what goes on in other people's therapy rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, people sometimes tell stories about what goes on. And frankly, uh, listening to those stories over the years, I've noticed that some, sometimes I believe them rather more than other times. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In other words, sometimes people have told a story and I've left with a little bit of a question mark. Now, that's a felt sense thing. Yeah. OK, it's a felt sense coming from my own experience and understanding of doing therapy. Yeah. I've been left with that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what do we mean by practice? What what really happens? You see, I think one thing with neuroscience is it's it's t still terribly early days for neuroscience and therapy. Yeah. Um, so I encourage people to delve into neuroscience if they feel attracted to it. If they don't, well, fine. Yeah. There is also the question of whether a basic neuroscience curriculum would fit well into therapy trainings. And I'm not aware this has ever been done. Hmm. Uh, and I haven't, I have explained this in a piece I've written and put on my website. Um, I haven't pushed for this because it be, could be a very big job and I've, my time and energy has been taken uh, as, as it is. Um, the one thing that I do regularly is I do a one day introduction to neuroscience at the end of the psychosynthesis uh, trusts uh, three year training. And I come in at the end and do this kind of neuroscience gig. <laughs> and there are things have changed over the 15 years or so I've been doing it. People know more about neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, than they did but it's very bitty and on the whole uh i'm talking a different language and it's a big stretch of the mind for everyone mm -hmm. and to really be able to use neuroscience helpfully in the therapy room uh, i think it needs uh, to some time you need to sit with it and read read a bit here and read somebody else there and sort of start to absorb it uh, you know the big picture is i would hope one day that some of the neuroscience is taught in schools so that people leave school understanding a bit more about our biology yeah uh, let me just put in there i had a little thing came to me when i was thinking early this week but our discussion today mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's about our human biology i remembered um do you know this song from the 80s sting um it's about the threat of nuclear war with russia uh it's a it's a classic sting uh song mm -hmm. and in that he said there's a line we share the same biology mm -hmm. in the west and uh the russians Mm -hmm. um, and I hope the Russians love their children too. Mm. And I remember that time in the 80s when I, I remember going to talks and uh, being quite convinced that there probably would be nuclear war. Yeah. And then Reagan and Gorbachev did a deal and the whole threat uh, diminished. So this thing of sharing the same biology, yeah. human biology, let's understand it better because there's better understanding these days of uh, heart and lungs and gut. There's a lot about gut mm -hmm. and people are understanding that better and the microbiome. Well, if we can do that, we can do the same with the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And it would be a bloody good idea if we did <laughs> understand it better generally. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really like that idea because it's a way of teaching biology that is immediately accessible and translatable into one's own experience mm -hmm. and if you can find in yourself some of the things you're being taught then when you see someone else that's very activated you can understand a little bit more deeply what's happening in them because it happens in you too yes that's right the understanding some uh, a shared human uh thing so in the therapy room yeah. Uh, 
by the way, I've just wound up my therapy practice after 30 years. I'm yeah. officially an ex-therapist. Okay, congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Having turned 70. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I always did what Jung said. He said, leave your theory outside the door, engage mm. with the person, yeah. uh, and if bits of theory sort of occur to you, then fine, they're probably... Uh, uh, that may, may be helpful. Mm -hmm. So I've done that with neuroscience as well as therapy. The first thing, to, as well as therapy uh, theory, mm -hmm. uh, first thing to engage with the person, meet the person. Yeah. Um, and listen and respond in the way we know about with, with focusing and listening. Um, and sometimes I've found a, a, a bit of a gentling, a, a, a con gentling theory concept would pop in sometimes a young theory would mm. come in uh sometimes some other bit from psycho what learned psychotherapy and sometimes a bit of neuroscience would come in. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. so in that way there's an equivalence but that doesn't mean that neuroscience is another model theoretical model for therapy because uh it isn't i don't think it should be used that way okay and by the way, my source for saying this is Yak Panksep, um, who was, uh, he's Mr. Affective Neuroscience. Uh, <clears throat> and it's only a small part of his book, which I have here, The Archaeology of Mind. And his work, I think, is crucially important. All the therapists I know who have gone into, who have read him, start to really really appreciate what he's saying because it speaks to our emotional emotions and feelings mm -hmm. in a way that a lot of other neuroscience cognitive neuroscience uh, does not mm -hmm. um and he's not very he's still not very well known about but it's a radically different take on neuroscience uh, i mean i'll just plug in here it's an evolutionary uh, understanding of the mammalian nervous system and the mammalian brain that we have as well mm -hmm. as our dogs and cats <laughs> uh, and i think i think it stands in quite con a lot of contrast to a lot of other bits of neuroscience a lot of which goes under the uh, heading of cognitive neuroscience these days mm -hmm. um uh for, i've tried to engage a neuroscience a big name neuroscientist recently about this and I've got no response, won't engage on it. So it's something I'm very interested in this mm -hmm. and it's it's actually I think quite a big issue generally in the world we live in today. Okay, so I'm I'm full of questions. Uh, <laughs> one of which is are you naming maybe kind of the leading edge of where you're going. But let's get to that a little bit later to see what's coming next for you, maybe, um, in terms of your thinking. But um, I'm wondering, some of the things that Jen Lin said, I know you, this doesn't necessarily resonate for you, some of his philosophy, but some of the things that he would say philosophically is this principle of interaction first that the you know the relationship the body environment are not kind of two that somehow that it's this constant interaction between the two um and i'm wondering how that fits with neuroscience because sometimes the way it's spoken about it can sound like it's falls back into a model of a self-enclosed subject and that there's something wrong inside of that person rather than in their way of being in a situation with other people or whatever. And I'm wondering if you address that tension in any way. Yeah. Well, you see, uh, I, I, I would say that Jendlin yeah. managed to write about the way our right hemispheres go about living and being with the world mm -hmm. in his philosophical philosophical and experiential kind of way. Mm -hmm. So in that way, he's a complete genius to be able to do that and to get on, write a lot and say a lot about it. And, um, you know, you see, it's interesting with Jenin because he was always 
rather hostile to science. I mean, he made some pretty derogatory, I've heard him say some pretty derogatory things. <laughs> He's in philosophy, not science. But uh, 2009, Ian McGilchrist's book, The Master in Zemistry, came out. Do you know that? Yes. It's pretty well known. Mm -hmm. And this is the Bible, if you like, on the differences between the two hemispheres. Yeah. And Gene started writing to me. Gene picked up on it. Somebody must have uh, told him about it. Gene picked up on it and started writing me about, get this man, Michael Chris, tell him about focusing, you know. Uh, so uh, I, I have had uh, some contact with Ian McGill Chris over the years, and I have mentioned gendering and focusing. He was slightly aware of it. Mm. Um, I didn't push it as hard as uh, Gene wanted me to because I didn't feel that was really appropriate. Um, but now we have this science-based uh, account of the difference between the hemispheres. Uh, it's science-based, but it's also from Ian's uh, work. Um, <clears throat> a, a lot of it was at the Maudsley in London, Maudsley Hospital, yeah. uh, with stroke patients. Okay. Where that, that's a large part of them. When one there's damage on one side of the brain and not on not on the other, and you see what the consequences are of that. And so uh, the master in his answer is caught on amongst a lot of people. It's got a cult following because, again, it speaks to their experience of themselves. Yeah, that the right brain, more sort of holistic sort of way of being is more the felt sensing yes. version of experience. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I have to put in my rider here. The problem with this is mm -hmm. that inevitably we all tend to try to understand the right hemisphere and the difference between the left and the right hemispheres from a left hemisphere place. Yeah. Which never works. In the end, it doesn't work. Yeah. That's a big problem. But we, particularly we focusers, know a lot about how the right hemisphere works because of our focusing experience. And that's true for anyone who's done a lot of inner work, mm -hmm. inner reflective work, whether it's focusing or, or something yeah. else. From our own experience, we know it. Yeah. Can I just ask about that? Because I think I think an example of that could be when I'm teaching therapists, for example, about focusing, it is very difficult to encourage them not to keep trying to pin it down mm -hmm. and label something or just you know come to a conclusion about something or transpose it back into some theoretical term mm -hmm. and lose the kind of the ongoing process aspect of it. Is that part of what you're meaning? Absolutely. Yeah. That's part of the skill of being a therapist. Yeah. But also to know how, when and how to use uh, the um, a, a psychological concept, for example, that might be helpful for the client in um relating to their inner experience and what what to do with it yeah. and you can only learn that you can only do that from a false sense place yeah. so you've got to practice haven't you you've got to experiment you've got to learn from experience and the more experience that you have the luckier you get yeah. <laughs> uh that's a throwaway phrase um and uh you 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 flesh out your false sense of of how to doing this kind of work so you're in a better place and maybe feel more confident so sometimes you you yeah you know, i mean this is how i worked with a therapist i did bring concepts and theory theories in but i uh was always checking myself for when not to do that but to mm -hmm. make an experiential response uh or Whatever I said, I was trying to find a way to put the person back to themselves, back to their felt sense. Yeah. And sometimes something conceptual was what was required to pe send people back to their felt sense. To, to, well, how does that sit with me? Does that ring true for me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's using theory, whatever the theory might be, or the term, the concept, in an experiential way, you're wanting to see, does it resonate? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, uh, it's bringing that into the 
the dialogue yeah. between the client and therapist and the therapist offering what they can and what they feel might be helpful, uh, trying uh, things out. Uh, one of the things I felt about, uh, what I noticed about focusing over the years uh, and probably applied to focusing on therapy is there's a tendency, in, I think, for the uh, therapist, uh, the focuser, to uh, focusing person, and it might be the listener in a partnership, to hand over too much to the person who's focusing or they want to be focusing mm -hmm. and retreating too much themselves. There are two felt senses in the room, yeah. one for the client and one for the therapist. And it's the therapist's responsibility to uh, listen to their felt sense and to uh, draw on anything and everything that mm -hmm. they can sort of channel through their felt sense. And this thing of staying out of the way of the client's mm -hmm. process, uh, I don't really buy it. Get in there in the client's process, engage. Yeah, and, You know, the big difference can be stated quite uh, simply can't it instead of the therapist being the expert as in the classic sort of uh idea of psychoanalysis mm -hmm. uh the the therapist is somebody who's has learned a bunch of stuff more than probably the client has and can offer things mm -hmm. appropriate time and that's part of the kind of service that a therapist offers that's my view yeah i totally agree with that and yeah. Um, I know one of the objections to that that certainly comes up when I'm teaching is that's too directive. Mm -hmm. And that the, there's this kind of worshipping of this fantasy of being non-directive as though the moment you sit across from a client, your 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 presence is already directive just because you're there. Yeah. Um, but can I just ask what you've just described, which I agree with, um, is there a neuro science basis for that the importance yes. of that i'd yes. love to hear that because that that's... well it's quite simple our right hemispheres yeah are putting together the outer world and the inner world mm -hmm. all the time okay so the outer world includes the other person yeah you and i are doing that now yeah. client and therapist are doing that yeah. so that th we uh we ha all have a sense of self and a sense of the other and they're all mixed in in a way that our left hemispheres cannot pin down and mm -hmm. define mm -hmm. and can't really get, get it, can't really describe very well. You have to experience it, but it's a very fundamental human experience. People yeah. just have to sort of hear about and find their way uh, to it. It's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and you see that that's where a lot of neuroscience, it completely dovetails with uh, Jenlin's uh, thinking uh, and uh, is a big, can be a big support to uh, what we do. Um, of course, you can, anybody can take neuroscience, find a bit of neuroscience to support what, what they do and what they like doing. Mm -hmm. So CBT can do that very easily, and that's fine. That's the way it is. <laughs> uh, but there's um, if, if the cognitive approaches can harness neuroscience for what they do, well, focusing oriented approaches, more emotionally based, uh, experientially based approaches to therapy can harness neuroscience as well. Uh, in, and in my view, even more because it brings in uh, the whole nervous system, the body as well as the brain and and the two hemispheres i hope one day people will be more familiar with um the difference between the hemispheres and be easier to talk about yeah it's, i guess it's a huge step in psychology it's it's mm -hmm. huge i guess it's um the case that if anything is actually happening in therapy no matter what kind of therapy that there there has to be a biological correlate yes yeah, every moment of it, there's something happening biologically yeah, as yeah. well as whatever else. And a good distinction there goes back to Jenlin's theory of personality change. Is it um, 
what's happening are merely a, a, a talking about, a thinking about, a rearranging things in you know mental filing cabinets, mm -hmm. or is it really experienced, really felt? Yeah, really versus really, it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, um, I'm just aware of time, yeah. the time is going quickly, yeah. and um. I know in addition to neuroscience that you have been involved in sort of other areas of development of the focusing world and FOT practice and stuff. I'm wondering what else is going on in or what else you'd like to be sort of involved in or passionate about. Uh, right. Uh, passionate about. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm big into felt sense these days. Okay. So I've got started a bloggy thing on my website, uh, felt sense, uh, uh, notes, mm. so writing things about felt sense. Uh, I think felt sense is, um, it may be a great, a, a great contribution of gender into the world than, uh, focusing because focusing sort of suggests you've got to sit down and learn this thing, focusing felt mm. sense is all over the place. Um, and, uh, sometimes I want to challenge focuses appreciation of the first sense that's one thing because i think there's more to it than uh that some people uh, appreciate one of the, the reason why it's such a brilliant concept is that it comes with a practice the concept and the practice mm -hmm. are intertwined mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is maybe uh unusual for this sort of thing uh and it um enables us, helps us to understand in the inner world of the right hemisphere, which is also the inner world of what uh, Freud and Jung call psyche. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and people before them, of course, because, you know, psyche comes from Greek. Uh, it, it's a very, very powerful concept, and I feel there's a lot to do with it and i want to write a book about it oh and i think this is there are avenues here for taking the appreciation of our sense yes. and what we can do with that into all sorts of fields way beyond where we've gone with focusing so far different applications of it yeah i'm curious okay. what what sort of applications do you immediately think of and are interested in well, I, I think this is in the background for me all the time these days. Um, certainly working uh, in a group context, uh, working in an organizational context, uh -huh. how we run the world, how they run the world. Yeah. Because we live in a world that, as um, Ian McGilchrist says, it's very left hemisphere biased at the moment. Yeah. Gene Jenner would say, it's very unit model driven mm -hmm. and uh, that is very, very problematic. I mean, it's so problematic, the human race is on course to pretty much destroy itself. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. We're just destroying our environment. Yeah. Um, and we don't have to do that. It doesn't need to be like this, but it is very challenging, and I think the the situation we find ourselves in collectively is very, very challenging. I think the felt sense is, um, uh, well, for me, it's potentially a really useful uh, print organizing principle, if you like, which I feel I can do all kinds of things uh, with it, and that's what I want to do. And let me give an example of that. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, as probably we all are very exercised by what's happening in um, uh, Israel and Gaza at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they know there are very, very tricky issues there if we start talking about it. Well, what I've been doing is going back to my felt sense to see what I want to say. And sometimes my felt sense says, uh, just stay clear of it. <laughs> Diversion, don't need to go there. Sometimes it says, say something about it because if i didn't i would I, I feel i would be left with the feeling of having avoided 
avoided it and sort of suppressed something mm -hmm. that's difficult and uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but that is part of certain part of my daily experience at, at the moment. Yeah, that something in your felt sense in order to remain sort of open to your own integrity, it it requires some kind of an expression. Yeah. Yeah. And the felt sense, it, we need the felt sense. Any Anybody needs the felt sense to, for example, be able to say something in the world that would keep, well, not necessarily keep, but would stand a chance of keeping both Israelis and Palestinians on side. They could mm -hmm. live with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That is very difficult to do, but is possible from a felt sense place. So I just want to ask about groups. Is this is how you could imagine, you know, what teaching felt sensing to groups so that they're more subtly attuned to their experience with each other or listening to each other's experience? Uh, well, I would like to do this. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I've used groups of focuses to play with some of okay. ideas and uh, ways of uh, interacting in groups. And I've mm -hmm. learned some things, particularly from the European focusing meetings. Yes. I've written about it. I've got a piece coming out in the next uh, BFA newsletter about this, and I'm really interested to hear other people uh, input on it. So I sort of have this idea of stuff I work I'd like to do in the in the in the future, but whether it'll materialize, I don't know. I mean, I know that you have uh, taken in the past a role, leadership role in the the focusing world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> On the board or of uh, the institute? Yeah, I wouldn't call it a leadership role. Okay, okay. Consultative, <laughs> consultative role. Okay, consultative role. Um, when you talk about organizations in the felt sense, are you uh, kind of interested in developing organizations that somehow put this at the center? of how they organize yeah yeah, yeah. which is an uh, really an open-ended inquiry for all of us into well how do we do this yeah uh, what ways of working uh, organizationally fit with uh felt sense and yeah. which ways tend not to yeah yeah i'm very i've been vexed by that question for years and I'm very curious about it <laughs> yeah uh, you know uh okay well, there's there's tiffy what about the um climate change organizations in this country mm -hmm. because i see read and hear about a lot of stuff and i think well, this is not the way to do it mm -hmm. no 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so i would like to what my plans once we move to Devon is to um, get a little bit more involved in green and climate change groups and to maybe take some of these ideas and ways of doing things in there and see what happens. That sounds fantastic. And I'm sure there's other people in the focusing world that would come alongside you on that mission. Um, from my experience is that even as focusers, like in environmental groups, most of those people don't know focusing. Um, so they would somehow need to develop that sensitivity in some way. Yeah. Um, but even in the focusing world, that there comes a point where we kind of jettison in some way our contact with felt sensing as a potential way to organize and make decisions together and kind of leap to some traditional way mm -hmm. and kind of give up on it ourselves. And I'm curious about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe, yes, we, we probably do. And I think it's very easy to do it without realizing we're doing it. 
incredibly easy to do it just in a conversation uh, yeah yeah oh, and isn't that a thing with this whole way of approaching things uh that we keep losing it mm -hmm. i mean i keep losing my felt sense but i know to find it again yeah like, exactly. i'm not going to, i can't stay there all the time you yeah. know it's, it's not perfect i keep losing it but but i'm but i find my find my way back and i do and these days i can find my way back generally quite quickly mm -hmm. uh, one of the the problems with the whole felt sense way of approaching things and maybe you know generally focusing is that it's not perfect yeah we don't get a perfect world we get a messy human world yeah but it's a world that's uh capable of uh evolving changing um uh, adapting to mm -hmm. like, environmental changes um but you can't pin it down the way the left hemisphere yeah or the unit model approach wants to pin it down yeah put a computer system around it um it it, it just doesn't work that way and yeah. i'm increasingly alarmed at our not so much our reliance on computer systems uh you know not just our own computers but dealing with organizations that run around their computer system yeah but our lack of awareness of what it's doing to us and how it our sort of tolerance of the dehumanizing aspects of living in a world that is increasingly run by computer systems yeah it's i think really really alarming yes fascinating i, I want to go back to one last thing that you said before we finish um you were saying that even in the focusing world that there's i can't remember how you said it but like an underappreciation of what the felt sense actually is yeah I, I, that's a yes that's a statement i'm willing to hang my hat on of course it's a generalization <laughs> yes focusing world is a bunch of individuals yeah um but for example the you see this is why i found neuroscience and Ian McGilchrist's work really really helpful mm -hmm. there is this tendency to be a bit over literal about the body mm -hmm. uh, and keep talking about you know the uh, listening to the body yes we do listen uh, to the body but uh, I think we overdo it sometimes and I think what we're really doing in focusing is switching from a left hemisphere attention mode to a right hemisphere attention mode and the way easy way to do that is to center your awareness in your body and then it opens up this whole very different world of the right hemisphere which mm -hmm. is such a wonderful relief from all the left hemisphere driven stuff mm -hmm. that we inevitably do and get involved in in living our our daily lives so if we could understand that we're talking about what i in my book i say is the right brain and body ensemble mm -hmm. it's, a, it's one thing think of it as one thing working together yeah so you don't have to get don't have to get over uh, uh, uh obsessed with your physical sensations in your body or where in your body mm -hmm. that's valuable to some extent but only to some extent yeah just let, allow your attention to center in your body um i think there are a lot of places we can go uh where maybe we haven't been so far let me ask one last question <laughs> the second last last question um because when you say that i'm reminded of one of the things you emphasize in your book which is i think it comes from uh mcgilchrist where you're talking about the right brain if i remember correctly being kind of almost like holding the background the larger picture of things and the left brain being more foreground yes and I'm wondering if in the focusing process, for example, if I'm in touch with a felt sense, it feels it has that holistic sense to it. 
it feels like it's it has in it more than I could ever pin down or say. Mm -hmm. And yet there's moments where it kind of um, focuses into something more like uh, a foreground sort of word or memory or something that, and the whole body kind of responds and there's a shift. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if at that moment, the background and the foreground, the left and the right are working together and sort of communicating with each other. The problem then is when the focuser grabs what came as a word or something and wants to hold on to it rather than opening up to the whole process again. Yes. Well, I think what you're describing there, that that whole shift that comes, yeah. that's um, a, a right hemisphere a right brain biased or dominant sort of process. Yeah. And the right brain is dominant for uh, emotional arousal in the body okay. and in the brain, of course. Mm -hmm. So in letting go to what wants to happen from in, inside, that ar arousal drops down which then releases whatever wants to come, maybe tears, maybe things, words that we haven't said before. Um, and there's that process. And then, of course, the left hemisphere at some point, and maybe quite early on, wants to, as you say, grab it, grasp it. Yeah. And <laughs> McGugris makes this point that the left hemisphere is biased for grasping not only my tea mug, but for grasping concepts and mm -hmm. ideas. Yes, uh, and that's as we know is a it can happen in focusing. People get too hooked on, uh, and they sort of go off on a mental trip. So part of learning the art of focusing is is it not um, that including left hemisphere, uh, articulating some of it, but keep coming back to yes. the new felt sense. Yeah, that's there. Having said that, yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, I only come back quite later on because my left hemisphere has suddenly got so much to say. <laughs> it wants to say it, it wants to write it. So I let it go. Fine. Do yeah. that. Yeah. And you've got to come back uh, and, um, and see where you're at then. And maybe what the left hemisphere wrote is, is um, can be, can be improved, but we need our left brains to, uh, to speak, articulately and to write articulately and you know one of the interesting things in focusing uh, and you can look out for this is when the the la words come from the right hemisphere our words come from the right left normally our speaking comes from the left hemisphere mm -hmm. like i'm doing that properly mm -hmm. organized sentences yeah. but sometimes in focusing uh people uh say ungrammatical things mm -hmm. Jenna was always good about saying, don't worry about the grammar. <laughs> I'll just say yeah. that. Uh, maybe just a word, uh, a few words, maybe something that doesn't make obvious sense, but it feels right to say it. Mm -hmm. That's even sort of gibberish. Uh, well, that's probably a bit rude on it, not really gibberish. Um, it, it just has that feeling uh, about it. This is not something that I would publish probably not something i've published as a poem although it might get closer because poetry mm -hmm. is a more right hemisphere oriented use of language yeah maybe if you like a more balanced uh left and right whereas a lot of our uh, writing is very left hand inevitably very left hemisphere oriented i hope that makes sense that does make sense to me it often at the end of a focusing session i will want to come up with a sentence that i can take away that will remind the body of what the feeling was and it takes me quite a while to get the right words and if anyone else read that sentence it would be it would they would not get anything from it at all yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's right that's yeah. right yeah and uh you see that's uh, we won't have time to go into tae but um uh, a criticism I would have of uh, the 
of TAE is that it's a bit, I, I think it's too much prone to people coming up with a lot of stuff, saying stuff, writing stuff that makes sense to them, but it's not going to have much impact on the world. Yeah. And if you want to impact the world, you need to start with that, with what's come from your TAE process and uh, rewrite it with the help of the other side of your brain <laughs> uh, in a way that's going to uh, resonate with other people, which of course is perfectly possible mm -hmm. because we use both sides of our brain. We can tap into uh, the general zeitgeist of the use of language and what's going to connect what well what we hope it's going to connect with but it's like there is a translation process there yeah a bit of a further uh you, see, <laughs> you know i'm not sure it's actually translation it's just the next stage of working with the language mm -hmm. so you say something that uh uh people can you know anyone potentially can start to uh, uh get their head around and, and under, understand it um and uh, you know gene's writing varies doesn't it because some of what he writes i think is is very accessible and some of what he writes is very not accessible you have to be a focusing philosophy fan yeah. <laughs> to spend a lot of time with it yeah <laughs> but i don't think his process model book is going to have a big impact in the world but what people can do with process model or with something like that, um, uh, maybe will happen, can have more of an impact, maybe is having more of an impact. Now, <laughs> I, if somebody wants to challenge me on that, please challenge me. <laughs> it's interesting, I mean, it, I, I know we have to finish, but I just want to say, it reminds me that I, my impression, rightly or wrongly, is that for philosophers to understand Jean's philosophy or a process model, they need to know focusing for themselves. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like you say, they, they will either take it in some public language way or they will just not get it at all. Yeah, yeah. Do you know that's like when you teach uh, an introductory weekend workshop in focusing? um people start saying things oh this is like yeah, something exactly. else yeah now i what i've learned to do there is to uh ride with that not to sort of say well actually it's not like that something else mm -hmm. but the person is sort of making links in their own mind if they want to think like something else uh for now that's fine but let's let's keep going uh and probably they'll as they experience more focusing and think more about it uh, and talk with other people more about it they'll see that well it's not just this other thing it's um uh, it's something special in, in itself and mm -hmm. i've i should have recorded tons of things over the years of pe what people have said on introductory workshops because it's fascinating it describes the sort of process mm -hmm. uh, very well well okay there's more we could say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, let's not ramble on forever. <laughs> yeah, I found it very fascinating. Um, interesting to hear some kind of focusing experience re sort of reimagined and re uh, understood, if that's a word. Re understood. Yeah. Re understood in um more kind of neurobiological terms it's very interesting good good thank you very much well thank you greg yeah. i really enjoyed uh, our conversation yeah me too i really enjoyed it good okay good luck right Bye.